Would you take your Bible, please, and turn with me to do to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 11. Deuteronomy, chapter 11. We're in a series, and the series is expanding. A couple of weeks ago, I sensed the direction of the Holy Spirit saying, we're going to pray for healing. So the first week, we prayed for healing of um, damaged emotions, that God, God will restore give peace to our hearts and our mind. Scripture says he will keep you in perfect peace whose heart stayed on thee. The peace of God will, will, will surround your heart and your mind. Your heart is the seed of your emotions. The mind is the seed of your thoughts. And uh, his peace can, can protect both your emotions and your thoughts. And then last week we talked about uh, healing of physical infirmity. Today, I, I, I'm sensing this, this expanding on, we're going to talk about the restoring of financial blessings. This whole series is about restoring what has been damaged. And so today we're going to talk about restoring financial blessings. I'm in Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 26 through 28, and I'm reading from the New Living Translation. It says, look, today I am giving you the choice between a blessing and a curse. You will be blessed if you obey the commands of the Lord, your God, that I'm giving you today. You will be cursed if you reject the commands of the Lord your God and turn away from him and worship gods you have not known before. The biggest word in all of this is that two-letter word, if. It is amazing how big a small word can be. He says, if. Now, there are a couple of words that you're going to want to highlight. Uh, I've highlighted the word choice. The word choice means a selection. You want chicken or beef or tofu? Do you want a blessing or a curse? It's your choice. You choose between the blessing or the curse. The blessing implies prosperity. The word curse implies punishment. So you look at this, and this passage should be a cornerstone passage in our life because this impacts all of our life. But I want you to see this. God gave his people the freedom to choose between a blessing and a curse. We are free to make choices, but we are not free of the consequences of those choices. Does this make sense? Now, consequences, both negative and it's not, uh, can be positive and not so pleasant. So there are pleasant and positive consequences to decisions. So it says you're going to have the right of choice, but you do not have the right of the consequence of those choice. So the consequence will be a result of the choice that you make. Let me give you an example. God gave his people the freedom to choose between the blessing and the curse. Now here's the example. In ancient time, the Hebrew people would gather together to recite the law of God. They would hear the recitation of the word of God. There would be statements made and then the people would respond. Here was a portion of what would be said and responded to in that meeting. The leader would stand and say, blessed is the man who does not engage in idolatry. The people would respond, amen, or so be it. And then the leader would read the next statement, cursed is the man who engages in idolatry. And the people would respond, amen, or so be it. So blessed is and cursed is. So the effects of the blessing of the curse will be the result of the decision we make. Does this make make sense? The result of the blessing of the curse will be a result of the decision we make. And this this principle that was given through Moses in Deuteronomy 11, that principle was repeated generations, many years later, to Solomon as he's taking the throne. You read this in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, beginning of verse 14. Now, I'm not going to take the time, I don't have the time to read all of these verses, but for those of you who like to follow up and do some reading after this, you're going to want to read verse 14 through 23. And if I can summarize these verses, 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14 through 23, God laid out this simple principle to Solomon. Here it is. If you want my blessings, you're going to need to honor my word. If you don't honor my word, you will not receive my blessings. 
That's the Cliff Notes version of what he's saying. If you want my blessings, I want to see you honor my word. If you honor my word, you will receive my blessings. But if you do not honor my word, you do not qualify for the blessings. Now this, this principle that first came out in Deuteronomy through Moses and then repeated to Solomon generations later was repeated again hundreds of years later and many generations later in the book of Malachi. I'd like you to go to Malachi chapter 3. We're going to read verses 8 through 12. Malachi chapter 3. And here, many years after God reminded Solomon of this principle, we look at it in Malachi 3. I'm going to go verses 8 through 12. Should people cheat God? Now that word cheat in the New King James actually says rob. Well, a man robbed God. Now we think of robbery, we think of someone with a gun and a mask over and says stick them up. But how many know that's changed and now it's not just with a gun, it's with a click of the computer. You follow? They can steal your identity. They can steal this, they can steal that. He says this. He says, should people cheat God? You, you've cheated me, God says. But you ask, well, what, what, what do you mean? When did we cheat you, God? He answers, you cheated me of the tithes and offerings due to me. You're under a curse, for your whole nation has been cheating me. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, so there will be enough food in my temple. If you do, says the Lord, the heaven of hosts, I will open the windows of heaven for you. I will pour out a blessing so great you will not have room enough to take it in. Try it. Put me to the test. This is one of the only times in Scripture I see where God says, try me. Try me. Now that had a whole different meaning when I was growing up. When mom and dad, you know, put down the law on the curfew. And dad says, you don't believe me on this curfew? Try me. And how many know what dad meant? Yeah? Well, God says, test me. Try me in this. Your crops will be in abundance, for I will guard them from insects and disease. Your grapes will not fail from the vine before they are ripened, says the Lord. Then all the nations will call you blessed, for your land will be such a delight, says the Lord of hosts. Now, let me, let me just summarize what he's saying here in Malachi. The people were under God's curse because they had stopped giving God's tithe. And then he admonished them. They can, he gave a promise to restore those blessings if they would start bringing their tithe. You follow? He says, you're under a curse. And by the way, God allowed the curse. It could be said that God had cursed them. God allowed this curse. But he goes on and says, now you can, you can come away from that curse if you will just come back to honor my word. You remember when he says, there's a blessing if you honor my word, there's a curse if you don't. Here's the practical sense in this. So he says, there's a blessing to those who honor his word, his laws, by giving of the tithe. And there's a curse to those who do not honor God's word, who will not pay the tithe. So I, I've laid that foundation. Now I want to get into some questions. And when I've preached on tithing and, and, and giving in the past, there's been about four or five questions that have I've come. So I'm going, to, I'm going to pose these questions and give the response. The first question is this. And by the way, if you have the Full Life Study Bible, much of this material is in the article in the Full Life Study Bible. First question is this. Well, for, if we're to give tithes and offerings, what are tithes and offerings? In Hebrew, the Hebrew word for tithe literally means a tenth part. It means a tenth part. In Hebrew law, the Israelites were required to give one-tenth of their livestock, of their produce, of their income, which was used to support the priests and those who served in worship. By them giving of their tithes and their offerings, it illustrated that they knew that their blessings had come from God in the first place. You follow? Yes. Scripture also speaks of offerings in addition to the tithes. For example, when they, when they were building the tabernacle through Moses, and they wanted to build this tabernacle, they started receiving tithes 
or her offerings rather, offerings so that they could have the supplies needed to build the tent of meeting or the tabernacle. And, and you love this story. There was, there was one point where the people were so eager and so gracious about giving that at one point they couldn't actually keep all of the supplies that were being donated. So at one point Moses said, Edict, I need you to stop giving. Now I have yet to come across a pastor <laughs> who sends out an email and says, Do me a favor and stop giving tithes and offerings. I don't know of any pastor that has done that. Now, the thing you notice about offerings is they are given voluntarily. I want you to fast forward a little bit. You can go to the book of Haggai. Go to the Old Testament book of Haggai. If you're new to the Bible, you're going to find it towards the the last few books in the Old Testament. Haggai. Now, when you come to Haggai, Haggai is part of the generation that comes from, from Babylon or from Persia. You know that, Bab- that the Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians invaded Judah, destroyed Jerusalem, including the temple, carried people away like Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, carried them off into captivity. Seventy years later, the Persians had overrun the Babylonians, and King Cyrus of Persia gave the edict that any Jewish person who wants to return back to Israel can do so for the purpose of rebuilding their cities, their temple, and their culture. So they go back to Israel, back to Jerusalem. And then Haggai, the prophet, speaks up and says, we got a problem. The temple has still not been built. So let me, let me read something here. Haggai chapter 1, verse 2. <clears throat> this is what the Lord says, the Lord of heaven. The people are saying, the time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. Verse 6. You've planted much, but you've harvested little. You eat, but are not satisfied. You drink, but you're still thirsty. You put on clothes, but cannot keep warm. Your wages disappear as though you're putting them in pockets filled with holes. Look at the last part of verse 3. The Lord said to this message to the prophet Haggai, uh, verse 4, Why are you living in luxurious houses while my house lies in ruins? You research this. One translation says, why are you living in houses built with cedar and my house lies in ruin? Here's the backstory on this. When they arrived, some of the, some of the uh, supplies for building of this temple, the second temple, had already been provided, including the cedar logs. And they lay waiting for the workers to come along, like going to Cedar Edge. You follow? And so they, the, the, the cedar logs laid waiting for people to pick these up and start building the temple. But then the cedar logs started disappearing. And what happened was the people started going and picking up the cedar logs and using those to build their homes. That's why God says, why are you living in homes built with cedar in my temple lies in ruin? So they were building their homes on supplies that were intended for the temple. You follow? Are you with me? So he says here in Haggai chapter 1, as a result of them neglecting the temple and, and putting, and they, boy, they had luxurious homes and so forth. They were building their own businesses and so forth, but the temple lay in ruin. So it says here that they were suffering financially and suffering in other areas of their life. Now, over a hundred years later, this situation came up again through the prophet Malachi in the text I read just a moment ago, Malachi chapter number three. So the first question is, what are tithes and offering? Tithes are a tenth. And they go to the storehouse. We'll talk about the storehouse in just a minute. Second question is this. Why should tithes and offerings be given? I'm glad you asked the question. Because the first answer is real simple. Because the scripture instructs us to give. You're quiet this morning. Malachi 3 verse 8 through 10 teaches. Listen. Malachi 3 verse 8 through 10 teaches that giving less than a tithe not only is in disobedience to God's law, it is equal to robbing God. Are you following me? So why should we give? First of all, because of scripture. Second of all, because it helps the church fulfill its mandate to take the gospel into all the world. Thirdly, Because everything we have belongs to God anyway. You follow? 
God is letting us use our resources for our blessing and for His glory. So decide today that we're going to serve God and not money. In fact, Colossians 3 verse 10. Colossians 3.10 says, A greedy person is an idolater worshiping the things of this world. Idolatry is giving priority to something or to someone ahead of God. And Paul said in Colossians here said that, that greed is actually a form of idolatry. Next question. Well, how should we give? Well, first of all, we give in relation to our income. When we tithe, we're giving a tenth. Regardless of the amount, it's giving a tenth. How should we give? We give voluntarily. With an attitude of gratitude because we don't feel obligated to, we have the privilege of doing so. I was in a church some years ago where God had just blessed people in such a way they were looking forward to the offering every Sunday so that whenever the ushers will come down, people will start clapping. They did. It just erupted into an expression of gratitude and praise because, yes, we get a chance to worship God in this way. How do we give? We can give sacrificially. You go to 2 Corinthians chapter 8, and I'm only going to summarize because of time. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1 through 5. Paul is telling the, the, the Christians in Corinth how the Christians in Macedonia, northern Greece, had provided and given sacrificially to help people back in Jerusalem who were going through a very difficult time financially. Recession had hit Jerusalem. And so people back in Macedonia or Greece were giving sacrificially. In fact, when you go through this, you're going to see that the Macedonians were asking for the privilege of letting us give, catch this, let us give out of our poverty. They weren't giving out of their abundance. They were giving out of what they had. We give sacrificially. Philippians chapter 4, verse 19 says, My God shall supply all of your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. How many know there's a difference between needs and wants? And he said, My God's going to supply your needs. That's one of the, one of the benefits of giving sacrificially. It tests and grows our faith. And it shows us and proves to us that God will meet our needs. We give sacrificially because that's precisely the way Jesus gave himself when he gave himself on the cross. So let me give you a maxim or a truism. Here it is. How much we give is not as important to God as the act of giving itself. How much we give is not as important to God as the act of giving itself. Fourth question. This one comes up often. Are Christians today obligated to tithe? I've heard that through my years. Let me, let me just say this. Any Christian who says tithing is just an Old Testament practice does, and it doesn't apply to believers today is missing the point that God is calling for all of us to be willing givers. You with me? So why do we have... We do not have the choice to ignore godly principles simply because they originated in the Old Testament. Let me say it again. We don't have the choice to ignore the godly principles that originated in the Old Testament. God still expects us to abide by the ethical and moral principles of the Old Testament law, and that does include the practice of tithing. You see, the practice of tithing, actually, for those who say it's not, a, well, it's the Old Testament law, actually, the practice of tithing predated the law. Genesis 14, Abraham was tithing generations before the law was given through Moses. You follow? So this old print, in fact, if you want to go to it, in the Garden of Eden, God says, you can enjoy all of this, but there's one portion that belongs to me. That represents a tithe. That belongs to me. And when Adam and Eve encroached upon what belonged to God, that's when the problems really started. Are you following me? Yeah. Principle still true. There is a divine relationship between the Christian today and God's law. Jesus said himself in Matthew 5, he did not come to eliminate the law, but to fulfill it. In Matthew 23, Jesus condemned insincere tithing, but he immediately encouraged the practice of tithing. So following these laws are not going to save us, but they are an outflow 
of our personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Hear me what I'm about to say. While there is no New Testament commanded or New Testament command to tithe, there is nothing in the New Testament that states that the principle is no longer valid. In fact, the New Testament always encourages us to raise the standard above what was stated in the Old Testament. And that includes in giving. Final question, well, where do we tithe? Malachi 3, verse 10 says, you bring all the tithe into the storehouse so there'll be room enough in the temple. Storehouse is an, was an area in the temple. In the Old Testament, when you read of spiritual renewal in the land, and you can illustrate this in the, in the, the book of Second Chronicles 31, when there is spiritual renewal in the land, notice this, how many times the focus always was, was directed back towards the temple. Rebuilding, restoring the temple. Worship in the temple. And when you notice when there is a process of spiritual renewal in the land, the attention inevitably came back to the temple. In 2 Chronicles 31, the instruction was given for the remodeling of the temple, refurbishing of the temple, including a storehouse. So you see, offerings were brought and kept in a storehouse in the temple, and then they were distributed as they were needed. The storehouse today is your local church where you receive ministry on a regular basis, where you're actively involved and where you are accountable. I used to watch a little bit of Christian TV, but I'm not sure I'm spiritually mature enough to watch some of that stuff. I listened to a guy on TV. I gave his name, you'd know it. But he sat there and he said, send your tithe to our ministry. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, when's the last time you made a hospital call? When's the last time you did a funeral? When's the last time you did a wedding? When's the last time you sat down with somebody from marriage counseling? When's the last time you did it? You following? And so, confession time, had a person come to me one time and says, well, I, I, I send my tithe to such and such ministry. I said, that's fine. Let me know when you call them and ask them to pray for you and to come visit you in the hospital. Let me know when they come. Well, they live in such and such state. Precisely. See, your storehouse is your local church. You follow? That is your storehouse. So in addition to the tithes, the scriptures speak of free will offerings. Those are the offerings that are beyond the tithe. Now, when you go to the offering envelope, you're going to see on this offering envelope several, several categories. Among those are tithe, but designated offerings to things like missions. Benevolence, sponsoring one of our students to be able to go to youth camp or kids camp. A designated offering for the honorarium for the guest. You follow what I'm saying? Those are offerings, not the tithe. So you give your tithe to the storehouse, which in our, in our culture is the general fund of the church. You don't tithe to a department in the church. You tithe to the church. And if you want to help support one of the departments, such as youth ministry or one of the others, you designate funds into their net. Can I talk about this offering envelope for just a minute? Please use the offering envelope if you're giving money in the service. If you're giving online, it's very, very clear. But, but please don't just drop cash into the offering. Please put it on this. Now, we're Pentecostal, but we do not read minds. You follow what I'm saying? And so we really need you to help us to know exactly so we can be responsible for those things that are coming in for us. Are you, are you with me? Let me bring this to close, and then we're going to give you an opportunity to worship in tithes and offerings. We have to remember that everything we have belongs to God anyway. We have no rightful ownership to our possessions. We are stewards of everything God has given to us. Secondly, we must decide to serve God and not money. Keeping this in mind, Colossians 3, 5, greed is a form of idolatry. You with me? And far more important than the amount that is given, the sacrifice involved is what important. Can I, can I just make a statement here? You're going to have to trust me on this. Whenever we go through, uh, as a board, 
We review the finances every month. We, have, we review the finances. And when a person makes application for membership into the church, we really look for there to be, this is according to the bylaws, they need to have already demonstrated commitment to tithe, time, and talent. Of giving their tithe, supporting the church in their tithe, supporting the church in their talent, doing some ministry, and also being there. It doesn't make sense to be a member of a church and not attend that church. Hello? So if we're a member of this church, this is where we need to be attending church. Does that make sense? Okay? Now, when we take a look and see for the application membership, not one time, not one time in my 30 years of pastor have we looked at the amount. It doesn't happen. What we do is we look for a pattern. Has there been a pattern of giving? Has there been a pattern? I, can't tell you, I cannot tell you what people in this congregation give. I don't know. We have the records in the business meeting or in the business office, but I don't know. But we do have a record on the consistency of giving. Am I making sense? Does this make sense? All right. There are a few basic principles. And then, Michael, if you'll get ready here in just a second, and ushers, if you'll get ready. There are a few basic principles in regard to blessings and curse. I want to ask a stupid question. Door number one, blessing. Door number two, curse. How many choosing door number one? If you have an option, deal or no deal? Door number one or door number two? Well, obviously, they're going to choose the door of blessing, right? Keep this in mind. Blessings and curses are real. They are real, and our choices determine which we will receive. Hear me. Your enemy cannot steal your blessings, but you can walk away from them. When you give your life to Christ, you are in his hands. And the enemy cannot kidnap you out of the hands of God. Are you with me? He can't steal you from God's grace, but you can walk away from God's grace. When a, when a child is living with mom and dad, mom and dad are being blessed by God because they've honored God's word. That kid is the recipient of the blessings that are pouring down into mom and dad, right? Now that kid for themselves can decide they want to or don't want to honor God's word. And if they choose to walk away from honoring God's word, they walk out of the umbrella of God's blessings that rest upon their parents. So in that regard, they can walk away from the blessing. It's their choice. Are you with me? Third part, if we walk away from God's standards and His blessing, we can return. We can return. Malachi 3, verse 6 through 12, is very clear. He says, you're under a curse. And by the way, if you want to get rid of the curse, you can sit back and you can, you can bind and rebuke all the powers of darkness. It's not going to do it. God didn't say, if you, want, if you want to get out of this curse, step back and put on your armor and say, I bind and rebuke the enemy. The enemy didn't do this. You did it to yourself. So if you want to get out of the curse, he said, here's what you do. Start bringing the tithe back into the storehouse. So we can sit back and we can bind and rebuke the powers of darkness all day long. But that's not the issue. The issue is, I need to come back into alignment with God's Word. And he says this, if you start bringing the tithe back into the storehouse, you watch me, try me in this, I'm going to pour up, the, I'm going to open the windows of heaven, and I'm going to pour up so many blessings you can't contain it. I'm going to bless your fields, I'm going to bless your crops, I'm going to protect that. All right, is anybody, am I making sense this morning? So, 2 Chronicles 7, 14, if my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from the wicked ways. He says, if you do that, hear from heaven, forgive their sins and restore their land. So can I give you one final food for thought? Deuteronomy eleven twenty six. Look. Today I'm giving you the choice between a blessing and a curse. Your choice. It's your choice. Between blessing and a curse. Someone says, well, I can't afford to tithe. You can't afford not to. Are you with me? I'll start tithing when I can afford it. You can't afford not to. So Lord, we want to bring ourselves into alignment with your word. 
Lord, this is not a selfish statement when we say, we really want your blessings. Lord, that's not, that's not out of a motive of, 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 of greed on our part. We really do want your blessings. You've given us the choice to choose your blessings. So I pray across this, this congregation, individuals, Lord, that they will trust you in giving what really belongs to you anyway. And I pray as they, as they begin or they continue this discipline of giving, Lord, that you'll open up the windows of heaven, that you'll bring the provision into their life. Lord, their testimony is all throughout this sanctuary of people have testified how you have brought provision into their life. So I pray that upon this congregation. In your name we pray. Amen. Ushers, why don't you come? How many understand now why I said we're going to receive the offering at the close? Right? That's right. So, Lord, we've already thanked you. We've already prayed. We ask you to bless this offering now. In your name we pray. Amen.